So, Makers on Tap. Welcome back to the podcast, Aaron. Thank you. It's nice to be back. It's been, what, like two, almost three weeks since we recorded? Yeah. Because of life. Yeah. And it's madness. We're trying this new thing where we're trying to do things in person now. Yeah. I was worried as shit having you right here. (laughs) Not working at all. So I just uh, edited the, the the last Earth Bonfire episode, and we jived really well in that setting. And it was just relaxed. We were just comfy, just hanging out. And I'm like, we should do these in person more. And I think that's uh, something we should maybe try and shoot for. Well, the, the bonfire really added to it. Yeah. And now it's cold. Now it's like we could, 12 degrees. We, we could we could light a candle in the recording studio. We could light a candle, yes. We could I, maybe do a couple of candles. Uh, maybe incense. Get like the whole the the whole recording vibe. I don't know. Um, yeah. So what are we talking about tonight? We're just hanging out. Whatever we want. That feels so freeing. It does. What have you been up to? Well, actually, we're skipping around because we're not doing our normal format. What are you drinking? <laughs> what am I? Not, what am I not drinking tonight? Man, Aaron's already had so much. I had a wonderful hot cocoa stout from Industry Brewing. I'm almost finished with a North Peak Brewing Company Rascal Cherry Porter and an adorable glass bottle. You haven't even. It's almost done. I, ha- I had to get another beer before we recorded. That is really good stuff. It is crazy good. And then I have a Lining Kugels Cranberry Ginger Shandy, which I thought was a Budweiser. <laughs> and I was very pleasantly surprised when it was good. <laughs> <laughs> and I am drinking uh, VHS Northeastern IPA from Industry Brewing, uh, which was uh, really good. I also drank somebody else's cocoa, uh, whatever whatever the, the cocoa stout you had was. Is that why I finished it so fast? No, I opened up Sam's and then I started <laughs> drinking it. And I was like, this is not an IPA, but it is delicious. I'm glad huh. that I messed this up. <laughs> yeah, it was really good. But, so what have you been up to? What have you been working on? Well... If uh, you've been following me on Twitter, I've been putting a lot of effort into my new basement workshop. So I got four 5,000 lumen LED lights from Harbor Freight. And I got them all up and wired up in my basement. And it's crazy bright. It's so bright. It, it, is, it is very, it, it is wonderful when I'm looking down. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm looking even remotely straightforward you can see the bulbs in my upper peripheral and it hurts <laughs> do they not have any diffusers on them no oh man so i might need to come up with some sort of diffuser for it okay yeah the, i think that'll help a lot i have a whole bunch of the super cheap ones from menards they sell them as two packs for like i don't know it's like 20 bucks for a two pack no that's, that's and they're reasonable. they're daisy chainable but they've got a diffuser on them so I ended up having quite a few of them in a room to get like very directional lighting. Mm-hmm. And it's really nice. I, I need two more in the room that my current lab slash studio is in. So I can, cause I've got a lot of shadows. I don't like shadows there. A long time ago, I found a, uh, a article on Jalopnik, <laughs> Jalopnik. Yeah. Jalopnik. Yeah. Jalop- the car, the car blog. Another one of those words that I never say out loud. And then the time everybody hears it. This is, this is what the podcast is for is for Joe to figure out how to pronounce things that he never has to say out loud. Like system D you used to think of as system MD or system. Nina, and then I, I talked to a Linux person and they're like, it's system D look at it. Like, I hate you people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but they had an article on like garages and like the perfect garage. And this one guy had this garage that the entire top of it was just various types of lights from like mercury vapor spotlights to panel led lights. Hmm. And they were different heights. 
And the whole idea of it was that they all cast different light in different ways. So there was no shadows anywhere in the garage. That's fun. It was all just blanketed in multi-directional light. So it's like walking into Menards. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very much. And I've wanted that ever since. Yeah, so I've been working on that. Um, so I, I actually bought a, it's like a four, like a four port, uh, power strip almost and i cut the the dingus end off whatever you call that the the ac plug (laughs) and then i stripped it and then i wired that into my existing ceiling lights code inspector is not listening to this (laughs) i I hope so so now I i have this four outlet power strip on my outlet switch and now uh, I just, and so all those LED lights just have, you know, basic AC outlet plugs. So I just plug it right into that. And so now I got, I turned the, the base and light on and those doors turn on. Please tell me you at least didn't tend the ends of the wire that you wired into that. I didn't. Good. No, I, I mean, I did the proper, you know, <laughs> little screw, screwy doos. Um, Are the screwy doos rated for stranded wire? Because I'm sure that plug was stranded. It certainly was. If you're an electrician and you know, you should tell us on Twitter so Aaron's house doesn't burn down. <laughs> I mean, it works. It does, it, but it will and work I in am, five years. And and I and it, as far as electricity goes, I am that person. We're like it works. Whew. So. Oh man, I don't know. Okay. Don't don't email me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I've been doing that, and also I um, I finally started to upgrade my Prusa i3 Mark II. Nice. It's it's gotten to the point where printing anything is obnoxiously loud because the bearings have lost their tolerances, and the the entire bed starts to shake because of how wobbly the bearings have gotten. Um, the belt's starting to dry out, so I, I ordered a pack of some some of the Igus Drylin bearings. And then for the Z-axis, they originally had two of the shorter LM8U bearings. Mm-hmm. I got the LML8UU, so like the double wide. Yeah. So it's one longer bearing, so two shorter ones. I read that I read somewhere that that was a, a, a considered an upgrade because I don't know. I think it's half a dozen one, twelve in the other, or six in the other. Yeah. I've anyway. drank enough. <laughs> so I got I got are hard. I got. Just about all of those were placed last night. I ordered some some toothed either pulleys because the stock either pulley on the X axis is non toothed. Yes. And the the teeth mesh or not mesh on the non toothed gear and that bugs me. And I realize it it's 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 a hot topic. It's a weird topic because if you read like Gates's website, they say it doesn't matter, but they're also not rating their belts for precision movement. They rate their belts for like, does it move the axis this way and that way? It's probably all right. Like, so um, it, it depends. And it's a really interesting discussion. It gets really in depth on the rail core forms. Hmm. because they I have it. very expensive toothed pulleys that you can buy <laughs> or not very expensive toothed pulleys and people are vehement one way or the other. And um, Tony takes a very uh, non-biased approach and he's just like, this is what the documentation says, this is what our findings are, and this is what we recommend, and you can do whatever you want. And I really like Tony for that. <laughs> just in my head, it just feels weird yeah. to have rubber teeth just like mm, mashing themselves on a on a completely smooth surface in my head it sounds like <laughs> yeah it just doesn't it just <laughs> feels weird in my head <laughs> so i got some of them coming um i was going to use steel belt because i have a lot of that left over but then joe said don't no i i actually bought steel belt for the massive z axis and um, I was like, oh, steel belt, because I have really long lengths. I was like, it's not going to stretch. And then just in the time that I ran the Mazov, I actually saw cracking uh, of the the steel braids. Um, but 
in the small, very tight radii that people run for printers, they break up really fast. So Kevlar belting is better. The best is the 2GT belt that of gates that you can get now. So for printers, I mean, we're still making stuff out of molten plastic that's coming out of a nozzle. It's only going to get so good, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So with your Igus bushings that you got, did you get the ones that are in the housings already? No. They're just plastic bushings, and I yeah. zip-tied them where the old things were zip-tied. Is there a lot of slop in them? No. No? Okay. I mean, that seems like a, a relative question. It is a relative question. So I can move. I can, So I can, from what I, I've already put in there, like it shifts a tiny, tiny bit, a tiny, tiny bit. But I don't know if that tiny bit means a lot of bit because I'm not also not a machinist. So the way I guess bushings are made to be done, if they're just the plastic ones, is they're actually made to be pressed into a metal housing of a specific size. And that shrinks the ID of the bearing to oh. a specific size. And that puts them on size. You can't see my air quotes because this is a podcast, but I see. There's, there's air quotes happening here. And the way they get used in the printing world is the like, questionable because you're pressing plastic into plastic and is that plastic shrinking the bearing to the proper size? Oftentimes, no. I see. And there's like specific companies out there that are not going to name that do it and it's not good. Um, but, you know, it works because, again, we're squirting molten plastic yeah. out of a nozzle and laying it down and who cares, right? We're making plastic trinkets. We're not making yeah. stuff for the space shuttle. Um but I guess now makes, because of this, actually, like, in direct response to this, they now make bearings that are drop-in replacements for the LMUU series bearings that come pre-pressed into aluminum housings that actually have the snap ring grooves and everything that the LMUUs have. And they're, like, dead on the exact same size. And they're beautiful. And they cost, like, a dollar or two more a bearing. So it's... Oh, nice. It's not that much more expensive, um, yeah. But there's like a proliferation of these bearings out there that don't have that housing, yeah, you know, from that, old stock, which is that's what I have. Yeah, <laughs> you'll probably be fine. Oh yeah, <laughs> well, I'm sure it's fine. Yeah, it's it's not it's not a super high precision machine, anyways. It was you know designed and built back in 2016. It, it only- works well enough. You know, I always think 2016 is only two years ago. Like 20, like the last like year and a half didn't happen. Almost two years. <laughs> Just I feel, like I, 1980 was 20 years ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I just graduated high school. I mean, Aaron, that was 10 years ago. <laughs> what? Old. Oh, man. What have you been up to, Joe? Oh, so much. So much. So, um... I've spent the last week digging into uh, Mesa card configurations for Linux CNC. Oh. And uh, I'm particularly excited about it because I got it all to work today, finally. And uh, it has repeatedly bit me. Like, I've been repeatedly reminded this week that in the machine world, newer is not always better. So I started this project out trying to get everything to work in Debian 10 ran into dependency issues. So had to revert down to Debian 9 and then uh, got everything running in Debian 9 fine, I thought, using Linux CNC 2.8, which is the second newest version. They're currently developing on 2.9 right now. And then was working on it today, was trying to get an accessory that used to work on the previous machine, working and then figured out that when Linux CNC upgraded from 2.7 to 2.8, they completely changed all their naming conventions. So all of the configuration files that this uh, USB jog pendant came with, they're all garbage. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, I am not, uh, I'm sure I could figure it out, but I don't have time 
to sit down and, and figure out how to rewrite all of these configuration files to work with this thing. So I reverted everything down to 2.7 and everything works now. Luckily, I've done the configuration files enough times this week that it took me about 45 minutes to revert from 2.8 to 2.7 with like a com- completely clean config, but holy crap. <laughs> nice. So um, it's been a been fun because I've been looking for an excuse to dig into this stuff for like a year and a half now. Mm-hmm. And uh, I finally got a project where like I had a legitimate reason to spend a week yeah. really digging into the stuff and knowing it better. Um, and it's, it's one of those like situations where, you know, Linux or- CNC is a really great open source project that is, um, it's hindered by its own success kind of thing. And you know, it's, it's normal in the open source world in the sense that like the documentation all exists if you know where to look for it. And uh, none of it is uh, a quick win. So, you know, a really specific example with this is I needed to be able to generate a PWM out of this uh, control card. And there is like no example files out there. <laughs> of how to do that, but there is documentation that is very, very low level in the weeds of like, if you need to generate a PWM, here are all the available things. And you point it to the available channel and the available this and the available that. Nowhere does it tell you like, if you just want to try something, point it here and you need these three lines. Nowhere. I couldn't find it anywhere. And, uh, you know, when I went out and asked on the forums, they're just like, well, if you open up your config and you open up this thing, it will tell you the pins. And uh, here is the manual page that will tell you the rest of the things. Thank you. Thank you for leading me to the information, I guess. (laughs) But could somebody just show me a configuration file that has this stuff configured so I can like see context of how the syntax is done. (laughs) That's all I want. (laughs) You know, that's nice until you get into documentation where, Oh yeah, we'll give you some examples, but then we're also rapidly iterating. So it's a, it's immediately out of date. Yes. Which is what I've been, I've been struggling with at work because we're we're using Azure DevOps for, um, uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment stuff. And they're just constantly churning out new features and, and deprecating old ones. And I, I'm getting to a point now where I'm starting to get more comfortable with literally just reading the source code to know what they want me to F and do. Because <laughs> yeah. the documentation just says three different things. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, the, and that's how I figured out that the, uh, um, the USB pen, it wasn't going to work with the newest version of Linux CNC is like, like I, I started to read the error messages that I was getting. I was like, these error messages are, they're not super verbose, but they're really telling me that like, this isn't right. So then I loaded in an old config that used to work from the old machine uh, that used a parallel port instead of the Mesa card. And when I tried to open that up, it, it pulled me into this weird wizard where it was like, ooh, this config looks like it's from Linux CNC 2.7. We have changed everything. <laughs> and this script will try to convert your files. There's no guarantees that it will work. I was like, oh, good. This is my problem. <laughs> so, yeah. I, yeah, you're exactly right, though. Like, I can see why they haven't strictly documented this because they are constantly developing on it yeah. and limited resources and everything. And like Linux CNC is a, or not Linux CNC fusion 360 is a really good example of something where like every time they make very good example material and tutorial material, it was almost pointless because in two months they're going to come out with a yep. new tutorial. That's just going to ruin all of that. Yep. Or they're going to change the UI 
so drastically that it'll make that tutorial worthless. <laughs> and it's it's why I haven't made a bunch of Fusion 360 tutorials lately because they keep screwing with the UI and how like licensing works. And now I can't work on my friend's files for them because I have a commercial license and they don't have... Mm. I, Fusion, I don't like you right now. You're making me mad. I don't have a better option, so I'm going to keep using you. Open SCAD. No, it's not. Not for what I'm doing. <laughs> I wish. I wish FreeCAD was a good option, but it's not. It's really <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah, I actually put that in the Ubuntu 2004 survey. I'm like, they're like, what do you see in the next, like, Linux in the next, you know, five years? I'm like, Linux CAD, like professional CAD. There are no good Linux CAD options out there that are professional grade. Creo, if you, if you Creo that, runs on Fusion or runs on Linux. Oh, well, if that's my ignorance, then if you've got a Unix license server floating out somewhere in the middle of nowhere, it, it, and it might not anymore. It used to back in like Creo one, Creo two days, there was a Linux version. Hmm. I, I don't know that anyone ever used it, but it existed. Yeah, because I threw it out there that, you know, since Microsoft is now pushing uh, their Office apps into Linux now, they're, they're, really? they're, yeah, they're moving towards Electron apps for Office, which, okay. you know, take that as you will, but it's, it's Office apps on Linux. So now it's like, what's holding anybody else back? Well, games, which is now less of an issue with Google Stadia, but the big thing is all these, you know, professional um Productivity apps. Yes. Stuff like Fusion or Autodesk, AutoCAD, Creo. Photoshop. Photoshop, you know, all that fancy stuff. Yep. I had a thought. I couldn't finish it. Oh, like, I, I simply, we were talking about this earlier, I simply want to be able to scale two monitors at different ratios. That's all I want. I want to be able to run a 4K monitor at 200%. And a 1080p monitor at 100%. I want to be able to dual boot and do all this fancy stuff and no. everything work perfectly. No. I'm Joe. I don't. Uh, uh, all I want to be able to do <laughs> is run one monitor at 100% and one monitor at 200%. It's not that damn hard, guys. I wouldn't think. Maybe I'm wrong. You're I'm probably pro totally wrong. I'm probably wrong. I'm pro it's probably <laughs> damn near impossible. <laughs> this is why Joe's computer never works. Could be. I mean, the, my computer always works. I made the joke. Most of the time. I made the joke earlier when we were talking about this earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Joe's always complaining about some sort of issue he's having. Something's not working. I'm like, well, I, I, I can see why now you're running, you're running 1910. You're, you're running the beta version of Ubuntu. <laughs> you're on, you're on a newer laptop. You're dual booting. <laughs> you're running the development version of Linux CNC. There's a reason why I run. LTS. I, LTS all the things. I it's, like it's features. Work. Features. Features. My machines work. And they work when I need them to work. That's true. And there, there's a value to that. There is a value to that. And I put that in the Ubuntu survey. I said 1804 has been the first Linux distro that I have not wiped after six months. I have the same install since 1808. 2018. Yeah. And that, that's a testament to that. I will say 1904 has been working for me very well. And, you know, it's going to go end of life in like a, a week, probably. Because every time I start to really like a version of Linux now, it's like, oh, this one's going to be end of life soon. You better go do a disk upgrade. And then I'm going to break all your shit. Again, you're on the, the rolling, whatever, or whatever the short term release is. Some of us needed newer video drivers, all right? <laughs> needed newer <laughs> kernel support. <sighs> I'm awfully excited for 2004. Mostly because that's my excuse to actually upgrade. I'm excited to try Regolith. Yes, I'm going to that. I want to go to that too. I need to try it out beforehand. So I just set up a whole new Linux install to work on a couple projects set it up yesterday which is was a debian 9 and basically it's been to develop on this machine and have a, a laptop where i can like test bed some of this stuff before i i release it 
out to the machine that's going to make the things and uh, dig more into some things. But this one is not on a, a brand new laptop. It's on a five-year-old laptop. So it should have really good support. It should. So far, things have been going well for me. So, hot topic. Oh, God, yes. Yes. The Prusa Mini. Yes. Man, all right. I have so many opinions about this. Me and too. I know you do, too. Yeah, let's do it. Oh, uh, dude. All right, so, full disclosure. I'm a beta tester for Prusa. What? I, I, it's, I think it's important to put it out there. Oh, it I've is. been t- testing the Mini for what? I got it on my birthday. My birthday is November 25th for anybody who didn't get me a present and wants me to, wants to. Uh, <laughs> Prusa gave me a beta printer on November 25th. That was when I got it. Um, since I've got that printer, it's been phenomenal. Um, the firmware has had beta glitches, you know, like you would expect, but it's all been features that we are testing and giving feedback on. And they've been giving us incredible support. Like the, the features have been getting rolled around pretty quick. Um, and I just, I have a lot of really good things to say about the printer and not very many bad things to say about the printer. And that's, I feel like that's kind of shocking. Like I bitch about printers a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bitch about a lot of things. I bitch about a lot of things. We both do. Yeah. Um, so the, the hot topic that has come about is, so they started shipping printers this week Mm -hmm. and we're, we're recording this on December 12th. So they started shipping printers this week and somebody was reading through the mini manual Mm -hmm. and noticed that if you would like to run unsigned firmware, because they've started signing it with a private key, <gasps> that you actually have to modify the control board in a non-reversible way. You have to clip a portion of the control board out. They're calling it the appendix. You have to remove the appendix. We call it the foreskin. The foreskin. <laughs> the dingus. The dingus. You have to remove the dingus from the control board with like side cutters, and that voids your warranty. Does it avoid the warranty of the entire printer or just the electronics? Unclarified. Yeah. I think I don't know. I, I think, can't make comments on that. I think that was part of it was, is it just, because I think the manual was vague on that part. Is it just the electronics, which would make sense? Yes. But I can also understand if it was a whole printer. Because I think it was mostly to combat fires, any issues with the unsigned and by unsigned, mostly just unprusa tested yes. firmware, because any anyone can just download any firmware for like my printer at home. I can just download whatever firmware, flash it, and run it. You know, it could be safe or it could not be. Yes. Um, if I were selling printers, I think this is a a very clever, low tech, easy to implement solution to reduce the liability and support costs on my own stuff if I was having a lot of issues with people trying to get returns on stuff that they had customized and effed up themselves. So from a point of like, I used to work for a printer company. um, And actually, honestly, from somebody who just helped other people fix their printers, having this uh, stopgap in place where I can reasonably say like that you have not modified your firmware. Um, I think is almost indispensable. Yeah. From a support standpoint. Yeah. Is we would spend so much time both uh, at Lulzbot and when I was supporting printers for uh cat, I'd spent so much time going around and around while the user would avoid the issue of, well, I was dinking around in the firmware <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I flipped this or I made this in stop, you know, op- normally open or, you know, I've, I've changed these PID settings. Like 
you know, you would eventually get there, but you might spend like a whole day with somebody yeah. before you get around to like, well, I'm not actually running your firmware. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, end users are the worst. Yes. No matter which industry you're in. <laughs> and, you know, what? what's the worst for like somebody like us where we like talk to people at these companies? Like, I've had a couple times where somebody be like, hey, you know. I, I'm having trouble getting support from this company that I know you have ties with. Do you mind pulling some strings to help me get support? What could that possibly be? And then, you know, I do that and then it, like come to find out like, well, you know, we've actually been helping this person and they've been a little <laughs> less than helpful. And like, you know, according to our logs, they're not answering these questions. And then I, you know, I go back and I'm just like, what the fuck? All right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I've done the same thing in the software world. Yeah. I mean, it's a universal problem. And so when I saw this, this Twitter thread, it's like, I, I identified with, with Prusa and and the, the, the struggles. But the thing is, software is definitely different. Like a purely software product is different than shipping a, a printer that can, that can potentially catch fire. Yes. Like that's a whole nother level of liability that they have to deal with. And, when I saw this, I'm like, you know what? It's fair. I can see it. You know, but by 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 clipping this dingus off, you're not losing any functionality. No. Like you can still do whatever you want to the printer. You can still flash whatever firmware you want. You can even. I'm I'm assuming you can even go back to the signed firmware. Yes. This is literally just a gate saying you can't do custom firmware unless you clip it, yeah. and then once you clip it. You, that's kind of, that kind of avoids your warranty because you are now venturing outside the realm of what we can guarantee is safe. Yes. Because when they ship that from the factory, I can guarantee you that they are, they have unit tests on their firmware where they will just run that printer to shit to make sure it doesn't catch fire, break yeah. itself, whatever. They have all these tests. And if you were to change a firmware, all that goes out the window. Yeah. Should they be on the hook for that if the printer breaks or if it catches fire? Should that be on them to support? Not not, not even just die. I mean, not even support. Just diagnose. Like, hey, I bought your printer and it, it caught fire. Wow, that's a big deal. Yeah. And then you know, after a week or so of of, of support, it turns out, oh well, I found this this firmware which speeds up print time, so I flashed it. Yes. Well, and like. With the MK3 S, I, it's a really big deal because they have like things like stall detection yeah. and all that stuff turned on. That's all firmware parameter settings that you can dink with with M codes. And, you know, so like if you're, uh, if you, you're having like crashes that are false crashes and stuff, like all of that's parameters that somebody could be messing with. So, like, you never know if it's been firmware that they've been messed with. I think it was a really, I think it was the right way to do it. Yeah. Because they're not taking anything away from you. You can still modify the printer any way you want. Yeah. But by clipping that, you are physically saying, I take responsibility for anything that happens from here on out. I think that's the big, I think that's the big thing. It's... Yeah, they're not taking any. They're not taking any functionality or opportunity away from you. What they're taking away is the warranty safety net. Yes. If 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 you're okay with the way the printer works and everything, then you'll get the full warranty if anything happens because that's our printer. It's our our software. We are full. We did everything to that printer. So anything that happens is on us. But if you change it, if you change the software on the printer we did not test that we are not you know we didn't do the testing we have no assurance that it's going to work right it should not be us the manufacturer to support that or to to warranty that so it, it, it i do think it's the right way to go because it's still it's not really breaking any open source tenants no like you can still do anything you want to the printer um you know provided you you snip the dingus but it's just like, um, you know, when you like jailbreak a phone or, you know, you sideload anything like that, 
Like, you're taking it on you that yeah. that OS isn't going to cook your CPU or do something mm-hmm. damaging. And you know, if it does, it shouldn't be on you know Apple or whoever made your phone. It, it's not their fault that this other firmware that you loaded uh, damaged your your thing. And the thing that made me like second guess a lot of the outrage is the price point of the printer doesn't seem to. Um, like the instigate the rage. You know, it, it's a three hundred and fifty dollar printer. So if you damage it, you're I'll fight you on that. You're potentially out a couple hundred dollars. But any specific component in the printer is probably not over a hundred dollars, right? So it it's it's not like it's a six thousand dollar printer. Yeah. That you're instantly losing your warranty on. What's so. your fight? <laughs> I'll probably so. agree with you, honestly. But So, s- s- tiny side tangent. In, in our makerspace, we have a brand new Slack channel called Fight Me. Oh, God, I love that channel so and much. And it is my new favorite channel. It's for all the hot the hot takes on anything. <laughs> I don't know. The worst I, is when we agree in it. I think Gerbil should be on all CNC machines. Fight me. Oh, God. And <laughs> Joe's like, ugh. Anyways. <laughs> so, the price point, I think, invites a lot of the people who would normally get something like an Ender. Oh, I totally Which is agree. super, which is good. It's on point for, we hate recommending the Enders. And yeah. this is like, it fills that niche. And we're like, yes, get the Mini. It's, it's a reputable, reputable company. You know, you get quality. But because of that, if you look at the, the sort of the Ender modding scene, the community, everything is out there in the open for free because the printer's decent, but it can get better the more you put into it. Yeah. Um, I think the price point introduces more outrage because it's, you're inviting more people who are more accustomed to that sort of price range and they expect the same sort of maybe availability of options and and freedom yeah that you'd get from some some a, a pile of bolts and extrusion from china where you, but, it's it's assumed you get no support yeah but counter to that there's no warranty with an ender or a cr10 like they might yeah. send you a baggie of parts if you burn something up yeah. they might but they also might burn your house down you don't know you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a gamble. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, to your point where, you know, they're testing all that signed firmware. I'm still testing firmware for the SL1. Huh. Like before the SL1 builds go out to the public, we still get them weeks ahead of time. I've been beta testing the SL1 since before Murph. So like, I imagine the mini firmware is going to be the same, like, we yeah, will sure. continue getting the mini firmware before the public. So, you know, they're running it in their in their test units. They're running it in their farm because they're going to... Yeah, they're using the minis in the farm. Yeah, they're going to use the minis in the farm. That's kind of the big selling point for me. It's a, it's kind of like you're eating your own dog food. Yeah. You know, like if you're, if you're going to replace your entire farm with minis, like you're clearly invested. And like, and, and that was my big thing too is... You know, the market that they're really targeting with the mini is education and farms. You know, they want it easily supported and they want it super reliable. And putting a signed firmware, you know, stopgap in like this really points to that. Like, mm-hmm. This isn't necessarily built for the modding crowd. Like it's got a super custom hot end. It's got a custom extruder. It's got a custom controller board that's 32-bit running a real-time OS. It's not running standard Marlin. Which is awesome. I don't think it's running standard Marlin. I'm pretty sure based on our discussions, it's not. And based on everything I've utilized... I can't, I can't imagine it is. You, know, you're, we, you flash firmware by putting it on a USB key, plugging it into the printer, and rebooting the printer. And it flashes the firmware. Like, it's real nice. Softly neat. It's real neat. Um, so another point I wanted to make is that 
at this price point, I feel like the support cost was a almost a design constraint. Yes, totally. Coming from something like the Mark Threes, where you've got a, a eight hundred, nine hundred dollar printer, where you can afford a couple support calls. I imagine when they were designing the Mini, they're like, "How can we? Where, where can we? Where can we cut the expenditures, and where can we take that money and put it into value into the printer?" Mechanically and software wise, I think they came with a great compromise. Like the thirty two bit OS is. I think very revolutionary with as far as like all the other control boards out there. Mm-hmm. The display looks awesome. Now um, the the mechanics are decent. Whether or not you want to argue the cantilever thing, it's like meh. I haven't had a single issue. Yeah. So given all of that, and then the price point, it's like, what can we do to minimize the support costs in a way that respects the modding community? Given all of that, I think the the dingus is and i hope we can really solidify the dingus as the proper name for it (laughs) i think it's such a clever solution for it because you know if you if you want the warranty just don't touch it if you know if you want to do your own custom thing i think it's good to cut off to to literally cut off the training wheels is what is what you're doing and that's how we all learn as makers is we learn by our failures so if you're going to cut the dingus off and try and do something custom and you, you you mess it up, that's just part of learning. That's how we all, that's pretty much how we all have learned or, you know, is just by messing things up. Okay. Now I'm going to flip flop. So far I've been for the dingus and I have been for all of this. That takes into account two things, maybe two things. One main thing that we trust that Prusa has our best interest in mind that Fair. because so far I as a beta tester have not seen the firmware. So I am testing or I'm trusting that they have thermal runaway engaged and all of the safety controls that I would expect turned on by default. Are you not testing the thermal runaway Joe? I haven't had to. You didn't put a heat gun on it. I didn't put a heat gun on it. You, you should. I should. I should try Just that. Put a heat gun on it. Just the thermal runaway. I, ha- I, as far as I know, nobody's done that. There you uh, go. Thanks, Aaron. Tell, t- yeah, tell them Aaron sent you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Professional software writer. <laughs> so, you know, we're we're trusting that this company has our best interest in mind, mm-hmm. and that they are taking safety into account, and that what they're putting out is safe. Now, if somebody like Anet or Creality put this printer out, would we still support it in the same way that we are sitting here supporting it right now? No, not at all. Because of the history, the it's because of the trust and the, the brand loyalty that Joe has built with his company. Yeah. That was really the only big reason I was a huge fan of the print of the Mini in itself is given his track record of high quality open source design machines it's like all right instantly on board now i will say given all that i had a crazy thought this morning that i was i was blasting our podcast chat on was given the change of hot end given the custom control board like all so w- without the e3d hot end you no longer have a gpl hot end license without the control board you're no longer running i'm assuming they're not running marlin so you're not running gpl marlin um there's nothing else left on the printer that is external to prusa labs i feel like if they want especially given the dingus with the signed firmware if he wanted to he could totally completely close off the mini and say this is a prusa mini you you buy a mini, you get the mini. There's no changing it, and it's now a proprietary thing. If you want to, you can clip the dingus and make it whatever you want. I feel like he could totally do that, but given his history, given his track record, given what I have heard you know, from people talk about how he designs his products and stuff, I feel like I don't think he will. But given given all those changes. It's possible. 
It, it, given what we know about him. Yeah. It's unlikely. It's unlikely, but possible. And that was definitely just, that. that's definitely just con- conspiracy theory, Aaron. There's really no substance to that. Yeah. <laughs> I just finally took a second and like looked at all the changes as a whole. I'm like, you know, you well, could. Uh, you know, we, we've had other friends make the same argument or similar arguments that like this could be the makings of a walled garden. Yep. But we don't think so based on history. You know, I so as a Prusa owner, I've actually been feeling a bit of a walled garden just because of the ease of use. Because he's done such a good job. Yes. Why would I dick with it? And that's why I've never touched my Mark II until now. It's like, it works and it works well. Why should I ever mess with it? I'm just going to keep using the Prusa slicer and keep using all the Prusa firmwares because it works and it works well. well kind of Almost like the Apple model where everything just works so nicely together. Why would I do anything different? A, a similar argument was made. Um, somebody on Twitter today had made a comment about uh, buying a Black Friday Ender 3 and just modding the crap out of it, you know, putting five or six hundred dollars of mods into it for for funsies. And Joe actually commented on it and was like, "Why wouldn't you just buy an MK3s?" I think I saw that one. Yeah. And uh, the original poster was like, "I actually have one that I refuse to touch because it just works. This is a project." Exactly. And yeah. um, you know that that's that's what you're talking about is like. Mm-hmm. Why why would you screw that? It's it's the same reason why my my Taz six, other than the tool head, which I designed, is dead stock, because it's the printer that I have that I can rely on to work every single time, mm-hmm. and uh, that it's a tool. I have other things that are projects, mm-hmm. and that tool serves my projects. You know, all my tool changer parts were printed on my Taz 6 because my Taz 6 works every time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've had that Mark II since I built it in 2016. Like I said in my tweet, haven't had to touch it since. It just, it's worked every, I, I even just start the print and walk away. Yeah. And it just works. I never have to worry about it crashing or or failing the start of the print. Whenever people talk about the these Taz is at the space. They're like, oh, make sure you start the print. Because like, yeah, it's just going to fail five out of six times. No, it's not. I I rarely get these printers to start fine here at the space. That's because you're an idiot. Uh, no. <laughs> partly that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how my, my mini has been. You know, I, I texted you guys the day. I, I drove 500 miles. I stuck my mini on a table in the hotel. I hit print and then I went to work. I didn't even wait for it to start yeah. printing. I was just like, well, it'll be a mess or it won't. And I want to see. That's kind of why I'm a little Prusa fanboy. It's like, they just work. Yeah. And I don't, that's why I haven't wanted to mess with it. But I respect people's choices to want to mess with it. Yeah. And, and you know, like, I think it's right for people to question decisions like this. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's right for them to be big, whiny babies about it. Right. <laughs> Which is what happened on the internet this week. Yes. <laughs> it was, yeah. And really, I think the issue comes down to maybe the manual should be more explicit as to what, if, if it's just the electronics warranty that's void or the whole printer warranty is void. And there is there is some opinion thrown out about the Magnuson, like the U.S. Magnuson. Uh, oh, the Magnuson Moss Act. Mo- yeah, that thing. The, the, the act that says that modifying your car doesn't blanketly void your entire car's warranty. Yeah, someone threw that out there. I'm like, huh, maybe, maybe he is in the wrong. And so I read the, the F and link and it took me like five, ten minutes to read and comprehend. And I'm like, this isn't, I don't feel like this applies. I feel like you wasted my time for reading this thing. Right. Like it, it's, it's geared towards cars. And the idea is I should be able to put third party parts into my car and not need to use the manufacturer parts. Yeah. It explicitly said software isn't necessarily included in that um, because it's so complex. Yep. And I'm like, that's exactly what's happening here. Is it's 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 just the software is what's being affected. Now the Magnuson Moss Act has been used as precedents in court cases for other things like kitchen appliances and weird shit like that. But you know, in 
at the end of the day, basically what it says is that modifying one part of your vehicle doesn't you know, void the warranty of everything. Modifying your suspension should not void your engine's warranty. They have the function has nothing to do with each other. So, yeah, that was that was why that was put in place, and you know, it's something near and dear to a lot of our hearts because you know, if you're yeah. like me, you rip the stereo out of the car almost on the way home from the dealership, and you want to keep your engine warranty. <laughs> so. <laughs> mm-hmm. I will say after lo- after looking through that and thinking through it, I want to add a little dingus to the excess control system. I think that's really important, honestly. Yeah, it's like the whole now, now idea of your access control system is a safety device. Yeah, and ha- like having it open source and modifiable is awesome, so people can like change things and add features. But at the same time, you can't, you don't want to be held liable exactly because somebody made some weird change and then all of a sudden somebody that shouldn't have access to a tool had access to a tool and then got hurt. Yeah. And it's a really, and I feel like it's a really nice segue into running an open source business, similar to something like Red Hat, where they, they're selling Linux, which is open source, but they're, they're adding value by bundling up the quality assurance and the warranties and the support contracts. By adding something like this, I could say, you only have a warranty if you stick with what I give you because I have all of these checks. I have all these automated checks and balances in place to make sure everything works the same. There's no regressions guaranteed to work. You're free to change it, but it is no longer going to be what I have tested and checked and validated. Yes. So that's on you. And that feels like the best approach because it, it gives me the opportunity to provide the best firmware I can. But if you, but if you generally genuinely feel like you can do better, Got here, the dingus. Here, here's a dingus. <laughs> <laughs> also, let me know what you change. <laughs> you know, it, at the same time though, I think the dingus, um, it adds a certain sense of uh, confidence. Like, like, it shows that you're confident in the fact that what you're providing is the absolute best. Yeah. So, if you're not confident in that, confident in that, maybe don't add the dingus. <laughs> Yeah, because because one of the opinions th- thrown out in that in that Twitter thread was, well, what if there's an, what if there's an issue with the printer and we want to help develop a fix for it? Yeah, and you know if it's if it's closed, then it's like, well, how do we? You are now dependent on Prusa to, to figure it out and push an update. If it's open, you can you can you can you know open a pull request. Yeah, and there has been times, uh, especially. I think there was a comment made for temperature monitoring and uh, with the MMU2 where the community made fixes that were eventually pulled into main, but you know, the community made the fixes first. So I think the biggest thing is protecting the support costs, though. Like that That's the main reason yeah. for that that I can see. And I feel like that was a huge tie-in with the, the price point of the printer itself. Yeah. I feel like, I, I feel like there's probably some arbitrary number that they've figured out for their machines that like, you know, each, each, each Mark three costs us a hundred dollars in support costs per, per unit. I wonder if they took that and like, how can we slim that? Yeah. And I wonder if that's a, I, I could see, I could see that being a, a big um, d- d- design factor and how they come up with the machine and, and pr- how they price it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel like we could reiterate ourselves like nine more times, but we totally could. It's about time. Uh, do you have anything you want to add? Hmm. I'm kind of enjoying this new format. I am too. I'm also really looking forward to next week when I dig deeper into these Mesa cards. Ooh. Yeah. One, one final point. You you had given me you you had sent us that link for 
someone who is building Linux C and C on the Raspberry Pi four. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's something that I've been planning to touch on for like weeks now. And my Pi four is just sitting on a desk waiting for me to plug it in and try to build it. And something else always comes up. So <laughs> I've done that. I have Linux C C and C running on a Pi four. And so far I've ran into a couple issues. Um the one issue is I screwed up and I wasn't paying attention to the builds that I did. And I did the full desktop build and not the light build. And it's just too damn heavy. The Pi 4 doesn't have the compute power to run the full desktop build and run the de- the graphical desktop for Linux CNC. It's just too much. So I'm going to have to revert back to the light build for that. And the other problem that has held me back is the specific Mesa card that I got, which is the 7i92, uh, which provides two parallel ports, so I can plug it directly into one of my parallel port CNC machines. Um, doesn't have many readily made config files things done for it. There's a lot of like half done stuff that exists in the firmware. And um, I've been, I've held back because I've been intimidated by building those configuration files. I'm not anymore. Hmm. The biggest reason is I figured out that if I screw them up, it doesn't matter. <laughs> It'll just give me an error message. <laughs> I really didn't want to bork a hundred dollar con- control card. Mm-hmm. So uh, now that I know that um, it's really hard to brick that card, as long as I just flash firmware that's actually meant for that card and now I know how to flash the firmware um, I can move forward on that nice. so uh, that's where I'm hoping to update on on the next show is I'm hoping to actually get some machine movement out of that and um, I have plans to build a quick test bed I have stepper drivers a breakout board and actually stepper motors that I can hook all up to it just sitting on my bench um, before I build a CNC machine with it, so do you do you have the the four gig by four? Yeah, and even the desktop was too much for that too. Oh God, yeah. <sighs> uh huh. Well, there goes that. Well, I mean, um, now in in the documentation they say to build it with light, and I had so, I downloaded both versions, and I just wasn't paying attention to which one I flashed. So with the light version, that's literally just Raspbian with no desktop, right? It's got desktop. It just doesn't have like all the, it doesn't have like um, all the office apps and like all the weird stuff. It, it, it has desktop, just enough to have a desktop. Oh, so, okay. So it still has a desktop. It has desktop and it has like all the network tools. Because there is like Raspbian light. I'm pretty sure it's Raspbian light or Raspbian minimal, which has... It's literally just the server. Yeah. No that no desktop. And maybe maybe and like doesn't then, have a desktop and then you end up installing it in the process. The hell what it is. Because I've you seen do that end done up before. Getting a desktop. I've seen that done before because you can actually get away with even a lighter desktop. Yeah. If you did if you did a light install, then install a desktop on top. Then you have like a super minimal blank graphical desktop. Yeah. I've seen that done before. But in the end from what I'm reading, it's not worth the effort. It's still not good enough to reliably run a machine. On software stepping or just in general? On hardware stepping. Oh. And hardware stepping is lighter on the machine than software yeah. stepping. Yeah. So. Shoot. And you know, based on my past experience with running machine kit on a BeagleBone Black using hardware stepping, it, it was always the graphical interface that killed it. And that was where machine kit really shined was they had um, machine control, which is ported all of the graphical stuff to like an Android device. Yeah. So it was rem- the remote yeah. GUI stuff. And I, I never got far enough to figure out how to do all of that. It was the, there was like two guys working on it and, um, it always felt like there was an expectation that you were going to be a HAL expert and a hardware expert. Like the, there was an entry point to the install that I was not at. (laughs) 
I might be now. I don't know. Have you done much with the open builds control stuff? Uh, no. They've been they've been kicking out updates recently. It it's been on my radar because still based on Gerbil. <laughs> yeah, we have a black box that our three D gave us. So if we, we do to play with that. Well, one of us has the black box ghost case from hacking the website. Well. We should build them. We should build them all. And I'm like, and cool. Them. I've got these these white PCB plates with no black box to put them on. <laughs> we should build them all and compare them. We should. That, it's not really a comparison because they do different jobs. It's, yeah, it's like that video we were watching earlier where you're comparison comparing a S2000 and an STI. Like they do different jobs, but they do the same job. Yeah, just like the S2000 and the STI. They'll get you from point A to point B in different ways, and one is more dangerous than the other. <laughs> Fight me. <laughs> and with that. Yeah, it's the end of the podcast. <laughs> no, wait, no. Keep making stuff. This is the end of the podcast. Yeah, yeah.